It's good to sing about our history with God. With everything going on in the world, it's so easy to let fear creep in and let our current situation cloud us. We know what things look like now, but we also know He's always been for us, been with us, and He's teaching us how to actually walk forward in what He's done for us. All throughout my history, Your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing. It's been almost 49 weeks since we've been together in person, and it's been tough for all of us. Singing to an empty room has been different, and I'm sure at home it's not been the same for you at all. 
We've had to grieve this year, but we've kept going. We've seen evidence of his goodness. We've been able to travel beyond the West Hall onto the internet to engage and share with people even in different countries. We've chosen to make the best of it. And you've made a decision to still engage in online church. There's an amazing story in Luke 16 where Paul and Silas have been placed in prison. They're locked up in stocks. And it says around midnight, they were praying and singing hymns to God. In the midst of their restriction, their isolation, they showed us that it's possible to worship in the midst of the most difficult of conditions. They weren't focused on their bruises or their chains. They chose to look to Him. And that's what worship really is, a choice to place Him at the center. When we put God at the center of our money, that is worship. When we put Him at the center of our job, that's worship. When we sing together in song, that's also worship. Paul and Silas show us that it's possible to be men and women of worship in terrible conditions because we're constantly tempted to keep the focus on ourselves and lift us up. But when we stay focused on Him, it's transformational. So even in the midst of COVID and the challenges we all face, we choose to sing in spite of our circumstances. We choose our faith over our feelings. I've been really asking God to lead us with the songs that we sing. And a few weeks ago, my friend had a heart attack and had to undergo triple bypass surgery. The morning of his surgery, his wife felt a strong connection to a song and she sent it to me. All morning during the surgery, I listened to it on repeat and prayed that he would be okay. And he is. But that song, Make Room, had an impact so much that I recorded it for our service as well. So we continue to make room for God to speak to us either directly or through a friend. And in this case, a friend that was surrendering her heart in a crisis moment. He nudges us in all different ways. So we choose to look upward instead of inward and we'll continue to watch worship happen. Fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must stand. fit 
get up and praise the Lord Come on my song Don't you get shy on me Lift up your song So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for Thanks for joining us online and taking time out of your day to participate in our online services. If you're new, uh, we would love to help get you connected to all that's happening at Westside. And you may have some questions about us uh, and you can send an email to info at wkc.org and we would love to help get you connected. Now, there's a few things that are happening here at Westside that we wanna make sure you're aware of. The first is that we have things that are called short circles. They're this new short-term intentional gathering that are designed to bring us together and to foster community and friendship and energy for life. Due to the pandemic and restrictions, they're online and they're facilitated by WKC leaders. You can check out the options and find one or more that's right for you if you just head to our website and go to wkc.org slash circles. Now you can still join in on any one of the circles that has already started. Also available on the February menu is our special Ash Wednesday kit. We wanna help you start the journey of Lent and join with us on Ash Wednesday, but doing it in your own home. You can register and you can pick up or we'll deliver a service kit to your house that contains all that you need to lead your home in this annual service from the Christian calendar. We'll provide music to listen to, prayers and readings to participate in so that you can start a new tradition in your own space. Also, you can join us online for communion at home on Sunday, February 21st at 11 a.m. And so for everything on the February menu, uh, you can go to wkc.org slash menu. And lastly, our year-to-date giving continues to be well above budget. The current financial position is ahead of expectation. And there were two special offerings during this quarter that we took up. One was our building offering, which was over $64,000 that helps us continue to explore and upgrade facility to do ministry. And the other one was our Christmas Eve offering. And we raised over $19,000 that went to two partners locally within the city that were so excited because of your generosity. And so we thank you for your continual giving in these times. Now, let's keep going with our series on the deeply formed life. It's interesting to me that we keep returning to the opening chapters of Genesis throughout this series as a way of, of re rooting ourselves in an understanding of a vision for a deep life. In, in the origin story of Genesis, we see elements and insights into, into what our lives could be like if we well, if we could avoid the sort of surface level living that we've often settled for. Now, for the first part of Genesis, the book has been focusing on what we might refer to as a theology of origins. How was God involved in us being here? And, and what we're doing then is we're retrospectively considering that story then as formative for our lives today. However, the narrative of the book of Genesis changes at chapter 12 from this sort of massive cosmological language of planets exploding into reality and the origins of life, narratives of floods and giants, the writer sort of yanks up the park break on the story. And chapter 12 begins, now the Lord said to Abram, Abram, this character, which we also sometimes know as Abraham. And now for some people, chapter 12, 
with this massive turn of the story, this change in feel and sense of what's going on, is actually the real beginning of the biblical story. Like everything prior to chapter 12 of Genesis is almost uh, a kind of introduction of sorts, a sort of preamble, uh, a kind of how did we get in the mess that we're in right now kind of tale. But now, at chapter 12, the story really starts. In fact, it starts like this in verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and from your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. The Lord said, go. Abram went. In, in the brilliant book, The Gift of the Jews, the writer Thomas Cahill says this. He says, Abram went are two of the boldest words in all literature. They signal a complete departure from everything that has gone before. Out of ancient humanity, which knows in its bones that all striving must end in death, comes a leader who says he has been given an impossible promise. A dream of something new, something better, something yet to happen, something in the future. In every other ancient society, Abraham would have been given the same advice. Do not journey, but sit. Compose yourself by the river of life. Meditate on its ceaseless and meaningless flow. But Abraham went. So you've got this kind of fascinating story, but between the go and the went is something significant, something profound for the story of the Bible for the story of Judaism, for the story of Christianity, and perhaps even for the story of the world. Because this is where the story starts. A, a mere few chapters after we hear about it going wrong, we see a restorative God beginning to put into play a process that will fix it. For us, the hopeful aspect of this theology is that it makes explicit the intention of God. In our world of pandemics, political corruption, environmental damage, and increasing inequality, the only force for the future that can be trusted is the covenant that God made with Abraham. Through you, all the nations will be blessed. As Fleming Rutledge says, this is the opening event in the story of salvation for the entire race of humanity. And the hopeful turn is that despite the mess we're in, God's intent is to bless the world. Like, like, like that's a good twist. That's the sort of twist we want. We all get to be blessed. But just pause briefly there. In the contemporary world, we probably think about blessing in a very particular way that we might want to think about. For us, often blessing is interpreted as an excess of things that we consider to be of value. If you listen to how people talk about what it means to be blessed, generally that's what they're describing, an excess of the things they value. And notions of God's blessing ha have gotten overly entangled with notions of Western comfort and exceptionalism and progression. However, biblically, to be blessed is to be part of God's plan, God's story, to play your part in that. So accepting blessing, like accepting a gift, becomes contractual. It binds you together. It creates intentional relationship. So what's the catch? Like what's in this contract here? Well, it's actually in the text that we were reading just now. Our selective attention overly focuses on the I will bless you bit. It's like we've switched into sort of portrait mode where that bit's in nice focus, but everything else is kind of blurry in the background. But the Lord first tells Abraham to go. 
And the reason that he must go is that the blessing that he's going to be given isn't exclusively for Abraham. But he must go somewhere else so that he can be a conduit for blessing. See, the Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land I will show you. Like Abraham is invited because of the blessing of God to relocate and be present to other people in another place. This is what Rich Fiodas would call missional presence. Missional presence has not, however, always been the easiest thing for the church to navigate historically anyway, we kind of get caught in the extremes of monastery and mission. And I think Viotis says it well in his book. He says, we're not called to remain within cloistered walls, living ourselves, you know, in prayer apart from social engagement with the world. But nor are we called to perpetually and indiscriminately be consumed with being active in the world. So missional presence is to hold these two in creative tension because otherwise we won't be modeling, well, we won't be modeling anything different for our city or our culture or the world. Essentially, will not be a blessing. Now, and what we often tend to do when something like this is discussed in church, particularly in a church service, is we immediately start composing a sort of mental list of exclusions you know, reasons why a conversation about missional presence can't apply to me. And and we we almost do it unconsciously. Oh, my prayer life is, is terrible. I don't really read my Bible. I'm a new Christian. I have too many sins. I'm an old Christian. I have too many sins. And, and we start excluding ourselves from being able to take part in what it is that God has called us to in the world. But notice that the first thing that God says to Abraham is go. Before there's any forming, before there's any shaping, before anything, the first thing that we hear is go. And the first thing that Abraham did was he went. Like missional presence is firstly about who you are becoming before it is about what you're doing. And impacting our world is best done if it's grounded in the type of people we are becoming the type of people we're being formed into. There's too many people trying to pretend to be perfect. There's too many people trying to be perfect before they can do anything in their world. The Bible, the Bible is a story of imperfect people. I mean, like really imperfect people who are being used by God. Jesus calls this broken and dysfunctional group of people together to become his disciples, and he invites them to become like him. It's like the Bible is constantly saying to us, listen, Jesus knows that you're a mess, but he invites you to join in in what he's doing anyway. So if we are to even try then to live out this Abrahamic call, we're going to have to learn to live in the tension between doing and being. Like Abraham is told by God to do something. God says, go. But he's also told to be something, like be a blessing. And both of them, the going and the blessing, you know, the the doing and the being, they're held in tension with each other. They're both part of the same story. If you don't go, you can't be a blessing. And you can't go and not be a blessing. They're held together. But we have this tendency particularly in the modern world, to to compartmentalize our lives in such a way that we would separate our being from our doing. It's almost as if we intentionally avoid them overlapping. We don't want who I am and what I do to kind of bump into each other too much. Now, as Christians, I wonder if some of this is because We've been given really bad examples of what it looks like to be Jesus followers in our everyday lives. You know the sort of thing I'm talking about. That You've perhaps met that person. Maybe you've been that person for a while. You know, excessive Bible verses painted around your office walls, Christian t-shirts, and then the thing that causes chills in so many of us, you know, gospel preaching on the street corners. 
And this gives us this kind of anxiousness about what it would look like to live missionally. Other times our nervousness about living in that way is just our own resistance to messing up or complicating our lives. Being able to go to my workplace without any of the trappings of who I am influencing that could sometimes be attractive to us. But the call to be missionally present is rooted in the doing and the being of the call of Abraham. His call from God to go and bless, to be and do, is founded in God's desire to be with us and for us. Which is what I think we would call Christ-likeness. Like really what we're seeing worked out in the call of Abraham is exactly what we see in the life of Jesus. The call to go and the call to bless, which is essentially a call of a unity between being and doing. Like grab your Bible sometime, choose a gospel. Mark is a good gospel to start with. And look at how much of Jesus's impact in the world is incidental. And by that, I mean, it, it's not planned. It, it, it's not initiated directly by Jesus. If you look closely, most of the healings and miracles, they just happen. Well, I mean, they don't just happen, but I mean like this, they happen because Jesus positions himself with people so that the likelihood of things happening increases exponentially. Think about how often you see Jesus is, is going somewhere and a centurion comes to him and asks him to heal one of his servants, a woman who, is, who has been ill for a long, long time, forces her way through a crowd and, and just touches the edge of Jesus' garment. Jesus feeds people. He raises people from the dead. He heals blind men that he saw on the other side of the street. A man that can't speak is just bumped into. Jesus releases people from oppression uh, and, and spiritual forces. Often, just incidentally, these people happen to be there, but Jesus also was there. But also, while you're glancing through all these stories and seeing this pattern, notice how often the people that Jesus helps or heals are also unexpected. It is a centurion. Jesus, heals a, Jesus helps a Roman centurion in oppressed Israel. Right? He helps you know, people that have been kicked out to live outside the city, people who are struggling from diseases that everybody's scared of, so keeps their distance from. He helps the poor. He steps aside from being with the rich to, to, to heal the ignored. It's not just the church folk, but outsiders, rejects, enemies, strangers that Jesus helps. Why? Because he's for people. So what we see in Jesus' his whole ministry is that he is with people and he's for people. And this is what it's like to be missionally present. Like right at this moment, at this moment in history, our world is struggling to live out the call to be with and for. Like we are overwhelmed by exclusion and division. <laughs> the pandemic hasn't helped that. We are afraid of each other. Our news media, our politics, and many other aspects of our lives are forming and shaping us to be against each other. So this ancient Mesopotamian story of a man called Abraham might just contain what we need, the invitation to connection, to community, and to blessing. And this is why I say another word for this is Christ-likeness. Paul talks about it in Philippians chapter 2 that Christ came to be with us and he died for us. So to be Christ-like is to be with and for the world. And now, you know, that maybe sounds a little bit intense to hear on YouTube, just as you're kind of watching as you are just now. So what if we just phrased it simply? What if we just put what we're saying just now into a question that was something like this? How can I be aware of what God could be doing through me in the places where I ordinarily spend my time? Like that, that might sound you know, quite simple, but what if that's all there is to being missionally present in your life? 
Think about it again like this. How can I be aware of what God could be doing through me in the places where I ordinarily spend my life? So, as Neil Hudson from the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity says, he says, there is no one that is not called to follow Christ in every context, at every stage of life. There's no area of our society where God has not placed his people. A police, politics, fashion, media, education, health, business, government, retail, the arts. Each of these have Christians involved at every level from top to bottom. As they live out their discipleship, they shape policies, battle with unhealthy cultures, and wrestle with the most difficult of situations. How can I be aware of what God could be doing through me in the places where I ordinarily spend my time? You know, and that kind of makes me want to ask about ordinarily. In an article titled, Dwelling in Possibility, Mark Edmondson asked this question. How many places were you simultaneously yesterday? Like you're in a room, but you're also watching TV. You're also surfing the internet. You're also chatting via text, talking to your partner. But were you present there? Like we have immense opportunities to model something different to our world if we choose to be alert and aware of it, to be alert and aware of all the different places that we are and are able to be, to somehow work out our ordinarily. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, Jesus comes to his disciples and issues what is now quite a famous statement. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. Wait a minute, that sounds quite similar to what what God said to Abraham, didn't it? Go and work out this blessing. Well, it sounds the same, but it's kind of sort of the same. English translations always seem to render this verse pretty cleanly like this, go and make disciples. But the Greek text behind this is a slightly more complex. In fact, it's not quite as simple as translating it as go. A probable better way to translate the Greek text behind this would be to say, having gone. So not go and make disciples, but having gone, make disciples. Having gone there, make disciples. What difference does that make, you say? Well, it means that Jesus assumes that the disciples have already went. Abraham went, and Jesus assumes that the disciples went. He knows that they're already there. It's not that he's saying you need to go over there and make disciples. He's saying you are already there. You're already going into these places. You are already present in the world. So do something while you're there. Jesus doesn't want the disciples asking, well, where are we supposed to go, Jesus? But rather, he asks them to be aware of where they are so that they can be a model, a Christ-like model, where they are. You see, because being missionally present, it doesn't require you to become intrusive or awkward or coercive or annoying. Like Jesus, it, it, means, it means just to be present, prayerfully, lovingly, aware of what might be going on around you and responding to it. You know, when we, when we, often, when we often hear this call to go, we have a tendency to invade. But having gone invites us to sort of just look around where we are. Maybe that means that instead of Bible bashing the atheist in cubicle two, maybe just be alert to the sad person in cubicle four. Christ-like missional presence is probably best described in language of patience and empathy curiosity, discernment, invitation, justice, and service. As he does throughout this book, Viodas offers four practices that will guide and help us figure out missional presence. You can read them in full in the book, but let me just give you the four highlights just now. The Viodas says if we can just work on practicing these things, it might help us better reflect Jesus and the call of God on all of us to be missionally present in our world. Number one, he asks, what about the practice of hospitality? Can you be hospitable? 
Now, hospitality can range from like having someone in your home to simply being a better listening ear more than a talking mouth. Hospitality is about how we open our hearts to another in a way that creates space where change can happen. So we don't use hospitality as a front to try and preach at someone, like come to my house for dinner and then you pull out the Bible halfway through and start a study. But rather hospitality creates space for people to feel that we want to be with them and that we are for them. Secondly, what if we think about the practice of justice? Like justice is often considered a complex thing by many people, but you know, it's often seeming as if the sort of thing that's beyond us and, 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 and too difficult for us to engage with. Yet, interestingly, everyone that you know that's over three years old understands justice. Like you understood justice the moment you first said, that's not fair. See, we often connect justice to certain personality types or people, but really justice is just taking that it's not fair and turning it towards the others. So instead of just being selfish with our sense of fairness, where are the places where you can see it's not fair happening? It doesn't need to be massive, world-changing, but a desire to see beyond your own biases and self-protectionism and see where justice is needed or where a God who is for us would want to see justice practice. Go and bring blessing God said to Abraham, and blessing sometimes is about being treated fairly. Number three is the practice of commissioning our work. Now, we've talked a lot about the holiness of work before at WKC. You can actually track that uh, if you go back to our podcast and, and, and tune into our Work Rest Play series. You can find that on our website. But let's just say this. Most people spend a huge amount of time doing work. If we became aware that work could be a place to live out God's blessing, might the world, at very least in that particular place, become a better place? And finally, four, the practice of announcing the gospel. Like we say, that's not what I want to really get involved in. But again, I'm not talking about this kind of preaching that happens on street corners. I'm not talking, when I I say announcing the gospel, I'm not talking about a formula, a strategy, a system, or even a transaction. The gospel is the announcement that Jesus is Lord. So for us to announce the gospel is to patiently and lovingly be present with others in a context where we can offer the kindness goodness, love, and hope that we saw in Jesus. In that space, we are well located to announce that Jesus is good and safe to trust with our lives. And so Abraham went. Like being missionally present is to ask, how can I be aware of what God could be doing through me in the places where I ordinarily spend my time. Like following Jesus, being Christ-like, it calls us from the depths of our formation. What we've been talking about across this series, it calls us to be creative, to be patient, to be listening in our workplaces, our schools, or our streets. So that's our series called Deep. We've asked questions about sexuality, racial reconciliation, rhythms of life, and more. Later in the year, we're going to offer a chance to sort of deep dive again into this big read book. And and please, you know, do read the book and then kind of join us for one of those conversations when they're advertised later in the year, because it would be a great time for us to kind of see how these ideas are working out. My invitation for you, is to think about this series not as something that you sort of listen to and then move on, but rather that you would consider the practices and areas as you feel necessary. Maybe consider those areas and choose maybe one or two particular practices that you then want to work on. Consider the gaps, challenges, and stresses of your own, of your own life and wonder how might some of these practices help you in the pursuit of becoming deeper in a world that's shallow. For now, however, let me simply say this. May you find hope 
in the call of Abraham, that in your being and doing, you might be formed more deeply into what it is that Christ has intended for you and the world. Grace and peace to you. Rock of ages Clap for me Let me hide Myself in Thee Rock of ages clap for me let me hide myself in thee let the Let me